Who am I missing? Okay, so this is the exciting, exciting, exciting x ray tube lecture. We're going to get, we're going to take it a little slow. I don't have all the days in the world, but I need to make sure that you understand the construction of the tube so that way this information is actually going to carry out for the rest of the program. So the information that you're going to learn here is never going to be put to the side. It's just never going to be put to the side. This is going to take on and keep going forward and forward and forward. Got it? So it's almost like understanding what is pathology. You know what pathology is by definition. You just keep taking it forward. We're going to add to the information that you're getting. And I want to make sure that I explain it thoroughly. Just like we talked about, we're going to be skipping some chapters. And so when we do get to a new word, I'm going to try to explain that word. If not, I'm going to tell you if it's not too, too important here, I don't want it to take away from the fundamentals. We'll go back. Okay. And talk about that word later. Make sense. Everybody's on. Yes. Thumbs up. We're ready. How was the last class? What'd you learn? Wow me before we get into mechanics here. Wow me about methods of path, uh, path, uh, patient care. We just went over our last test. Good. Okay. Did y'all do wrong? Well? I can't speak for the class, but I'm happy with my grade. <laughs> okay. I like it. I like it. Okay. Good. Let's keep that trend going. Trend. Trend to positivity. Speaking of positive, we're going to talk about positive and negative. When I say the word positive, and I'm meaning an electrical charges, because we are now going into mechanics. We're going to leave the body behind. Okay, this is going to be your one class where we're not really talking about anatomy. We're not talking about the body. We're talking about the machine. So when I say the word positive, Harkins, can you tell me what that means? Uh, in relation to like electricity, electricity. Um, I mean it's, uh, you think of a positive charge. Okay. Let's go back to atomic. When you think of a positive charge, you think of the, it has an overall net charge is positive, it's but the charge is positive and we'll see that with protons, right? If you think of an, a negative charge, what are you thinking of? What, what particle of the atom that has an electric, a negative charge? Electrons. I almost gave you the answer, right? So we're going to be speaking on positive and negative. Positive charge, negative charge. Got it? Positive charge, negative charge. So in order to understand the x-ray too, we're going to see a positive side and a negative side. Okay? And what is the philosophy, anybody... When they say that little analogy, positives attract what? Other positive or negatives? Negative. They attract negatives. Negatives will repel the same charge, right? So a negative will repel a negative, but a positive will attract a negative. A negative will attract a positive, however you want to put that. Make sense? We're going to talk about that attraction. We're going to talk about that flow. Y'all ready? We'll saddle up because we're about to go. All right. So the x-ray tube, everybody should be on chapter five with me. Here are some of the objectives. Oh, I spelled it. Uh, Jack. So sad. Typing too fast. All right. Objectives. Describe the parts of the x-ray tube and the general construction. That's what you're going to get out of this chapter. Explain the process of x-ray productions. So ladies and gentlemen, no more to wait. You are going to learn how x-rays are produced. Okay. Describe the basic understanding of how tube works to competently and safely formulate exposure techniques to minimize patient dose. Understand the safe operations for extending tube life. It's almost like saying, you know how you have your favorite pen? 
It's your favorite pen, right? No, you don't have, never had a favorite pen, Luke? Okay. Uh, anything that you can think of that you don't want it to, to, to waste because you like it so much, right? No? Nothing? No, you're not with me today? Okay, we'll stretch, stretch. Go on and give yourself a nice stretch. Oh, we're about to get into it very, very deep. All right. So we're going to think about extending our tube life. If we have no tubes, we can't make x-rays. If we can't make x-rays, we have no jobs. That puts it in perspective for you, right? Can't be an Uber driver if you have no Uber vehicle. All right. So let's get to talking about our tools. So when we think about the radiographer's responsibility, we talked about protection, shielding, time, distance, so on and so forth. But again, this is about the mechanics. This little baby right here, this little baby is like looking at a piece of machinery. A machinery that we use in order to make x-rays. Can't see your huh? We can't see your PowerPoint. Oh, so sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Good. So these were the objectives that we talked about right here. Can everyone see that? Perfect. When we're looking at this, we're talking about the x-ray tube. This is the x-ray tube. This is going to come in two different forms that we're going to learn about. Okay. So when we're talking about whose responsibility is for operating this equipment, we're going to point that finger right back to ourselves. It is our responsibility to know how it works, right? When it can create a, uh, an unsafe environment for ourselves and the people around us and patients, and how to ev eventually, how to make sure that it is, has the um, uh, quality assessment to make sure that it's properly calibrated and functioning. So in this chapter, my friends, my wonderful, beautiful audience of class 2022, you are going to learn numbers. You are going to start applying units of measure for radiologic quantities. Got it? Don't get up and do the wave just yet. We'll wait till we get to something more exciting. So appropriate operation and maintenance stems from the knowledge of how it works. So we are going to know thoroughly how it works. Got it? So let me see what you do know. Let me see what you do know. So you take a look at this image and we say, oh, it looks like a basic tube, right? This is what we walk into a room and we see. We already learned what is the ceiling mount, right? Or overhead mount. Yes. Good. We also know where the collimator assembly is, right? Yes. We also know what these buttons will do and how we move the tube, correct? What we're going to explore is this that is sitting behind the face of the tube. This is called the tube face, the tube head, and all of this is considered the x-ray tube, okay? So we're gonna take it into pieces. So as we start to say, okay, well, that does not look like that, right? But I want you to understand we're working what's inside back here. We good? Everyone understand? We're still on the same trail? Same path? Beautiful. All right. So here we go. The first section that we're going to talk about is protective housing. What is the protective housing? Sounds like a house that protects, doesn't it? It's in the name. It's in the name. It is a house that protects, right, Isbeidi? I saw it. When you think about... Hold on. This is Julie's that I'm going to do a 
<laughs> You're good. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Making sure that they weren't calling me. All right. So the protective housing is going to be outside of the actual tube itself. Okay. The protective housing is going to be on the outside of the actual tube itself. It serves as a mechanical support. So it is basically going to house the delicate items in order to create the x-rays. It is also going to serve as an electrical insulator. What does that mean, insulator? It's like a cushion, like a cushion. It keeps the electricity inside. Good. Thank you, John. And thank you, Esmeri. It keeps the electrical uh, electricity inside. It keeps you from getting shocked, right? Keeps you from getting shocked. Think of some items in your house that would be considered an electrical insulator. First of all, what items need electricity? Light bulbs. The light bulbs. Okay, good. What protects us from getting shocked if we were to touch the wires of a light bulb or a lamp? Rubber. Or a toaster, or anything that is going to conduct electricity. The cable. The, the cable. cable. What is that cable made of? Rubber. 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 So you think about materials that are out there that are going to prevent you from getting electrical the electrical shock. Those are items that are going to insulate that electricity. So the protective housing is considered an insulator. It is going to protect you from getting an electrical shock. Does everyone understand that? So if you touch this while it's operating, you wouldn't, right? Because you're supposed to be six feet away, right? Behind the operating window, second dairy barrier, right? But just in case, if you touched it in the middle of an exposure, you would not get shocked, all right? But what else does it do? And you can see that I like color coding to emphasize. So not only does it provide a mechanical support, provide an insulation to electrical shock. It also is a thermal cushion. The word thermal, what does that mean? I'm gonna start calling on people because I'm starting to see a glazed look. It's and that more. gives me the indication you're not listening to me. Tracy, go ahead. It is heat. It is going, thermal is heat. So here, not only is the protective housing going to be a mechanical fixture to place our tube inside, it is going to protect us from electrical shock, and it's going to protect us from overheating, burning ourselves if we touch it. So there are three things that the protective housing does. And more, actually. Mechanical support, electrical insulator, thermal cushion. I'll be asking you these questions here shortly just to kind of keep you awake. All right. So let's talk about the general construction of the tube housing. It is lead lined. Why would it be lead lined, Wani? If you look right under, usually I'll put something, but why would it be lead line? Why would we need this protective housing to be lead lined? Lead line is like something that absorbs, that protects. Mm -hmm. um, so we say that the protective housing has a bit of lead in the middle to do what? Why do we use lead or lead equivalent? Juani, I'm back to you. Lead equivalent? Mm -hmm. mm. 
Why do we use that? Why do we use, why do we need lead line secondary barriers, primary barriers? Why do we have that? To protect uh, from radiation. Perfect. You said it perfectly. You see, this is not rocket science. Just because this is physics doesn't mean that you will not understand what lead lined means. We've already discussed it in our primary and secondary barriers. Correct? Good. So the lead line structures absorb stray photons or x-rays. Photons or x-rays. Photons means x-rays. Photons mean x-rays. X-rays mean photons. I can use those words interchangeably. A photon is described as a bundle of energy. A photon is described as a bundle of energy. So x-rays is a bundle of energy. Make sure you put that in your notes. Perfect. So the protective housing is not only lead line, it's going to pick up or absorb those stray photons or x-rays. Okay. It also is lined, not only lead line, but inside it has a lot of oil. It has a lot of oil. It's been lined with oil. The oil is not for absorbing photons. The oil is for dissipating heat. The oil that is lining inside of the protective housing is for dissipating heat. There is also a cooling fan that is used for dissipating heat. So the mechanical structure of a protective housing is lead lined, layered with oil on the inside, and has a cooling fan. We've already discussed that it's an electrical insulator. And it has an accessible, it has an accessible area for these large cables. There is a large amount of energy to create x-rays. There is a large amount of energy that is needed to create x-rays. A large amount of energy needs to have large cables. These cables have access in this section. So the protective housing has a lot that's going to it, doesn't it? Right? What's the purpose of being an electrical insulator, Sharon? To prevent the electrical shock. Good. How does it dissipate heat, Duan? How does the protective housing dissipate heat? Oh, uh, you can use the oil that a coiling fan. It has oil. Perfect. How else does it dissipate heat, Justly? Heating fan. The heating cooling fan. So we have some cooling fans. Perfect. Good. How does it prevent from photons escaping, Luke? The lead lined. It is lead lined. Great, great. And how do we get that energy inside of the protective housing, Shibu? You have to unmute for me. Oh, yeah. Can you repeat that? How do we get that large amount of energy inside of the, of the X-ray tube? From uh, uh, protons? Mm, we're going to create photons inside of the tube. Help them out, someone. 
large, large cables. These cables. large cables, but we have to have these connectors. So it has these areas so that we can mm -hmm. connect what we're talking about. Have you guys noticed all of these parts on the equipment? This is the whole purpose. So when we go back and we look at it, there's a cable, there's some cables, there's the access points for those large cables, right? Good, perfect, all right. Now, this is where I want you to remember. There is a certain um, quality assessment. A tube is not safe. An x-ray tube is not safe. If it goes beyond a leakage, now what is the leakage going to be considered? The radiation or photon or x-rays that leak out of the protective housing like we saw right here. You see this? These are photons that are leaving the x-ray, I mean, the protective housing. So some of them are being absorbed. Some of them are not, okay? The stronger ones are not being absorbed depending on how thin that lead line is. Make sense? So some of these photons may carry enough energy that it'll leave the protective housing. How much is unsafe? 100, what does this R stand for? Rankin, perfect. Here we have 100 um, millirankins. How much is that? Million? Milli? What is it? A thousandth of a rankin. A thousandth of a rankin. A thousandth of a rankin per hour at a distance of one meter they've kind of incorporated a couple of uh well what system is being used here the british the british we talked about the rinkin being the british right but yet we're using the meter right so 100 millirinkins at a distance of one meter. Please remember that. Your tube operations are not safe if they go beyond this value. This is an FDA required standard. If your tube is operating at normal capacity and radiation is detected more than this value at one meter of distance from the x-ray tube, the x-ray tube must be shut down. It is leaking too much radiation. Okay. Any questions? All right. I want you to take a look at this image and I want you to, I'm, we're going to start, I'm going to ask you a few questions. This, this is going to be a little bit more engaging. So we got some parts down, don't we? We can see some items now. We can go back and say, ooh, that's a tight tension cable. That's a lot of energy coming in. Perfect. This is going to be considered a what? Let me ask you this. Is this the protective housing that we're looking at? If I were to touch this machine, would that be the protective housing that I'm touching? Yes. Yes. Everybody should be saying yes. Everybody should be saying yes. So there are parts. Run them back to me. Let me start with Sun. Tell me something about protective housing. Oh. Uh. You want to talk about like uh, the meaning of the protective housing? I can't hear you, son. Oh, hello. Give me one thing. Give me a fact about protective housing. Uh, 
really an uh, electrical isolation? It is an electrical insulator. Perfect. Give me something else, Pamela. Hello? You hear me? Yeah. Okay. It is, uh, it's a, uh, it also has a lead line structure. It's a what? The lead line structure. It has a lead line structure for what purpose? For, uh, the investigation. I would like that, but it's more for leakage radiation, so you don't get exposed. All right. Give me something else, Javier. Thank you. Give me something else. There's a reason why I'm doing this. Prevents electrical shock. Okay, we already had that one, and we oh, also uh, had um, leakage. Give me something else. Uh, it absorbs uh, photons. That's the leakage one for oh, me. Yeah. So I, um, I like your voice, Javier. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it has what about, the, too, heat? What about the heat? Huh? It, it, it can be cool, but with the, uh, the fans <laughs> and the oil. Good job. Ding, ding, ding. All right, let me see. So we also have oil. What's the purpose of the oil, Isaias? Unmute for me, Isaias. Uh, sorry. Jolie, help him out. He's coming back. I'll get Isaias in a minute. Jolie, help him out. What's the purpose of the oil? Uh, to dissipate the heat. Dissipate the heat. All right, so heat is going to be a problem for us, isn't it? We can already see heat is going to be a problem, right? It looks like we got the photon or radiation leakage under control, but we have to monitor that at how far and how long? One meter. Five. Go ahead, Ruth. 100. 100. Um, One millirincan. One mil yeah, one meter weekend per hour. At how far? One meter. Uh, at one meter. Good job. Perfect. Yay! So now we're going to get into actually what's going on in. But before there, there are two cautions. We've kind of talked about them a little bit. The housing can become rather hot, even though we just said it was a thermal cushion. But how would it get hotter... How could it get hotter even though it's a thermal cushion? What do you think it would be? Is it the production of the x-rays? The production of the x-ray. The more that we use it, absolutely. The more that we use it, the more that it's going to get hot. Especially if we don't allow the photons to dissipate. I mean photons, the heat to dissipate. The high voltage cables should never be used for handling the tube. The tube has handles. For a reason, don't pull on the um, on the actual tubes. They always say that, right? Did your your parents ever tell you don't pull from the cord, pull from the actual little from the from the socket, right? Yeah, you heard. Same thing here. I'm not your mother, but I'm telling you as your teacher, don't pull from the cord. Okay, you can actually break them. All right. All right. So this one. Actually, we want to. It's not working. So sad. All right. So I had my animations come up here. I need you to pay attention because we're going to take this pretty slow. I'm reviewing you as we go, right? Reviewing or reviewing. The general purpose of the X ray tube is an, it is an electronic. So we know elect electricity is going to happen. When you hear the word electronic, that means, ladies and gentlemen, there is electricity. Electricity is the flowing of electrons. I'll say that again. Electrons are going to flow. Electricity is the flow of electrons. Electricity is the flow of electrons. So in the X-ray tube, electrons are going to flow. I know y'all are copying what I'm having on my slide, but I need you to copy down what I'm telling you. Got it? It is also a vacuum tube. 
what makes it, what is a vacuum tube, Naomi? What does it mean by it being a vacuum tube? We know Rinkin worked with it. Right. There's a constant pressure in there, maybe? Not exactly. I like that. I like that. Or the void of. When you think of something being vacuum, there is absolutely nothing in it. It is void of air. It is void of anything. It is a vacuum tube. It does not have air in it. And there is a reason for that that we will get to in a moment. So the x-ray tube, not the protective housing. Now we're actually talking about what's inside of the protective housing. It is both electronic and a vacuum tube. It is also considered electronic because it has, it's considered a diode. Does anybody know what a diode is? Doesn't that mean it has two parts to it? It has two parts that accept electricity. So it has two electrical components that we're going to get to. It's cathode we and have electricity connected over here. And we have electricity connected over here. Got it? So it is a diode. It is a, an electronic tube that is going to have electricity flow. And it is also a vacuum tube. It has no air inside. No air. It consists of an anode. It consists of a cathode. The two major parts are anode and a cathode. An anode and a cathode. It is encased in a glass, two types or metal enclosure. Sorry, we interrupted your feed, but this one happens to be a glass enclosure. It also has an induction motor. And we will specify what an induction motor does. Got it? So, here is the general construct of the X-ray tube. We've already talked about protective housing, right? Yes. And we can identify all the parts of protective housing. Here, we're now on the X-ray tube. So, the X-ray tube is a diode. It has an anode and a cathode. Electricity is going to flow. It is... Empty space, there is a vacuum, no air inside of it. And it can either be constructed of glass or metal. We good? We understand? We talked about protective housing and now we're on the x-ray tube. All right, so let's continue on with the x-ray tube. The main purpose of an x-ray tube, once you crack it, it no bueno. No bueno. If you break it, no bueno. It has to have a vacuum. Why would you think there would need to be a vacuum setting in order to create x-rays? Anybody want to take a stab at it? To protect from anything interfering with the production or the movement of them? Jalisa, you said it and you melted my heart. Beautiful. It is to prevent, the vacuum is to prevent any air from bumping into our electrons. We are going to have a stream of electrons and we don't want any interference. We don't want any interference. 
We don't want any air molecules to interfere with our electrons. Make sense? Does everybody remember what an electron is? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Perfect. There are two varieties of x-ray tube envelopes. There are two varieties of x-ray tubes. There's either the envelope of glass or it's going to be enveloped in metal. It still has an anode, it still has a cathode, but it's either gonna be a glass envelope or it's gonna be enveloped in metal. The glass envelope is made of, you don't have to know, I will say Pyrex, cause it'll say Pyrex glass. This is just talking about the type of glass it is. It is very heat resistant. The glass is used because it is very heat resistant. The glass is used because it's heat resistance. So this is a typical glass envelope. It's envelope meaning it's encasing. Here we have the, the anode side and here we have the cathode side. And you're gonna get to see which side is what by familiar objects that are uh, consistent to the cathode side and the anode side. But well, you can see that this is a glass envelope, right? Inside of here, there is no air, it is vacuum. The metal envelope looks like this. So here we have the anode and here we have the cathode. It is enveloped in a metal surroundings, not glass. So there are two types of x-ray tubes. Either it is encased in glass or it's encased in metal. They use the word envelope. Okay. Any questions between the two types of envelopes? Now, I did mention that the glass is better for what? Did you say heat, Marisela? Good. Resistance. Heat resistance. Now, why do you think that the metal one is being used? Well, there is a reason. So let's talk about the word. And in your reading, as you guys go and read, you're going to come across some words. I need you to pause. Make sure that you're looking at the word and not just dismissing it. Because this literature is very dense with information. Okay? Meaning that... Two lines, you've read two lines and you've probably absorbed two different concepts. Got it? Both types, oh, let's talk about the metal. The metal has a better property of attracting that our electricity flows in one way. So the metal has more of an electrical attraction, we'll call it potential, that it allows the electricity, the electrons to flow in one manner, in one direction. So they'll call it that, that electrical attraction or potential difference, whatever you wanna say. The whole purpose of the metal is that it'll keep the electrons flowing in one direction. When electricity does not flow in one direction, it goes into like fireworks, right? It'll look like this. When electricity is flowing from one side to another, you can see, you can see like an, uh, like an arcing. But if you, and an arcing, it means that you'll start to have electricity flow into other areas. When you have a metal tube or a metal envelope, it will extend the life of your x-ray tube because it prevents that electrical arcing. Okay? So an x-ray tube that has glass, better for heat. An x X-ray tube that is encased in metal extends the life expectancy of the tube. Miss Lara, 
What did you say about like the metal has a better property to attract? It's a, potentially, yeah. A, a, better, a better, it's a better, yeah, property to attract. It makes the electrons flow in one direction. You're going to see that in your book, it's going to say potential difference, but I don't want to get into potential difference right, right now. Okay. All right. So one is better for heat type of envelope. One is better to extend the tube life, right? However, if the metal overheats, you don't get to do x-rays. So they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Make sense? They both have their advantages and disadvantages. Now, remember when I said last chapter, there has been no breakthrough on how to make x-rays since 1895. We are still using the same, not technology, but the same recipe of making x-rays. So x-rays are made in a certain way. And we're going to finish talking about the construct of the equipment and we'll start talking about the process. Any questions here? So electronic arcing is when electrons move out of the flow of streams, right? We're wanting a stream of electrons. We're going to need a stream of electrons. And if they move out of the stream, that's called arcing. Okay. Any questions? No? Perfect. Can you repeat it, please? Right here, what electronic arcing, when electrons move out of the stream. So if they move out of the stream, you see what happened? Okay, so why couldn't we get this line to go straight here? Yeah, see what I'm talking about? So if we have this coil over here and this coil over here, you would think you'd have electrons that would move from here to here, like a bridge but they start to move and fall out of a stream, a straight path. And that is called electrical arcing. They start to create a roundabout instead of going straight. So a metal envelope will prevent electrical arcing better than the glass. And that extends the tube life, okay? So that you're able to use your equipment more before you have to replace it. Any questions? Uh, review time. Let's review of what we know. Hmm. It's Betty. What is this one pointing at? What is that arrow pointing at? If you had to label and put a label and I gave this to you right now and I said label all of this, what would you put there? I would think it's either the cathode or the anode. That's that's what I would think. Is it the tube housing or is it the tube? Let's go there. Is it the protective housing or is it the tube? Let's start with that. It's protective. Okay, so what are the parts of the protective housing? Is it the cords? Uh, let's see. The lead, the oil, and the electrical. So I would think it's lead. Lead line is on the side. Okay, I like it. You can see the little thing in between. Perfect. But what part of this is the protective housing? Let me go ahead and go to Aurora. Thank you. What part of this is the... I can see that little indention of lead lining good, but what part is this that's protruding out? What is that for, Aurora? I want to say that's like the thermal cushion. I guess where it keeps the heat. Or it could be the area where the high tension cables come in. Oh, okay. Okay, so we have two of them. We have one on the anode side, and we're going to have one on the cathode side. So these are these are going to be the little receptacles for those high tension cables. In between, you can see the double lining. That would be your lead line. If you're talking about thermal cushion, all just the metal itself is going to be that thermal cushion. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Mm, Luke, what is this that this pointing at right there? What is that arrow pointing at? Uh, the photons. That are coming out of what? What do we call those photons? They have a specific name the, now. Um, 
Starts with an L. Loose. 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 <laughs> I love the way you ring. Loose. They're on the loose. They're leakage. It's leakage. Oh, leakage good. photons. I like it though. They are on the loose. We got to capture them. All right. Perfect. Good. 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 So we talked about lead line. This is the protective housing. What is this one pointing at, Jonan? I can't hear. I'm sorry. The tube. The X ray tube. So here we have the protective housing and inside we have the protective or the protective, the, the x-ray tube. Does everyone understand how this all fits together? Because I promise you, if you think that this is the x-ray tube, you're going to run into some issues. This is why I'm taking it super, super slow. Okay. I'm gonna take a 10 minute, take a 10 minute, go use the restroom, recap, because we got more to go. We got more to stuff in. We're gonna talk about the anode next. Ms. Laura, um, going back to the vacuum tube, you said that's a void of air and the electronic is um, a flow of electrons. Did I get that right? Yep. Okay, thank you. It's a diode. So you're gonna have electricity coming out here and electricity is going to come in here. And we're going to talk about that. Electricity is going to go out. Electricity is going to go in. We're going to have a flow of electrons, which is electricity, from the this side to this side and back to the wall. This is why you have two high tension cables. Electricity is going to flow in, and then electricity is going to flow out. Ms. Lara, I have a question. Whenever you, we talked about um, the limit of, like, once the machine hits the limit, like, it's too hot, will it shut down by itself, or we have to check for it? It'll shut down by itself. Okay, I want to take a safety mechanism that it'll shut down by itself. All right, thank you. So, um... X-ray tube, like part two of two. So the vacuum is preventing the air from interfering, so that keeps it in? So the vacuum, it's almost like saying, you know how you have those space bags? Space bag. You know what a space bag is? You, <laughs> uh, they sell them all the time. You put your big items, like let's just say your linen, into a bag. Are you paying attention, Justly? Don't look away, Justly. All right. You put your items in a bag. They got a double little snap at the top. You attach a vacuum to it and you suck out all the air. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Do you... Her picture. I'll send her picture. Yes. <laughs> yes, please send a picture. Let me see. Let me see if I can share. It's so simple. Right. In my head, it sounds like a Ziploc bag when you like it. A Ziploc, but you take all the air out, right? And then everything gets flat on the inside because there's no air in there. A vacuum is the same thing. It means that you have taken out all of the air. So if I'm going to, this is going to, this is going to be my electron. And I have air because it's going to, it's going to bump. And my electrons are going to move somewhere else. But if I take away the air, my electrons are going to fly on through without bumping into anything. We're trying to remove all of the air molecules so it is not a bumper car effect in there. We want our electrons to, to flow over in a straight line, not in an arcing line. Because we have a destination for those electrons to hit. Okay? Good. I'm getting excited. Thank you. So y'all are on y'all are on break. So if you wanted to hang around and ask questions, go ahead. I just don't want you to say I don't give y'all a break. Miss Laura, going back to the two, I didn't get the arrow. The one is on the left side. Do you mind if you go back 
there. Which one? Where all the arrows from the X-ray to bar. That one. So right here, Wani, this is the protective housing, right? Like your house. You're sitting inside your house right now, right? So this is your protective housing. This is a closet. So this is metal, right? It's lead lined. We know it has two receptacles for high tension cables. We also know that it's going to absorb our uh, heat because a lot of heat is going to be made, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the parts of the protective housing. There's going to be oil inside of here for dissipation of heat. Okay. Okay. Inside the protective housing, we have the x-ray tube. These are the actual parts that we need to make x-rays. The protective housing does not make x-rays. The protective housing protects the x-ray tube. The x-ray tube is where we're going to have x-rays made okay the x-ray okay. tube has all of the parts to make x-rays okay is that better yeah are you understanding yeah. so if i label the arrow the one is on the top and the my right side it will be high voltage connector yeah and the one is down is the x-ray tube this is the x-ray tube yeah this one so the one is on the my left side on the top that one it will be the bottoms coming out yep what about the it's one coming down, down. the arrow the one, one is here is either can be the protective housing um mm -hmm. that's made of metal that is also lead lined you see the double lines right here you yeah. can say lead is in between there or lead lined and then you also have oil there's a reason there's parts of that and then okay. now we're going to get into this. We've only talked about the x-ray tube in, in, in a form, the envelope. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, what, how many types of envelopes do we have for an x-ray tube? The answer would be two. Mm -hmm. one, one would be which one? Glass and metal. Good. Which one is better for preventing arcing? Like glass is good for heat. And uh, metal is for uh, that dozen. Um, <laughs> I got it. Prevents it. arcing. Prevents overheat and the life expectancy of the tube. So it, it so extends tube expectancy, life expectancy, because it prevents arcing. But it's still so better than metal. Yeah, it extends the life of mm -hmm. the tube because it prevents this word right here arcing. arcing. Okay. okay. And that's mm -hmm. when you, the electrons start to flow out of the, de the designated path. Oh, I got it. All right. Thank you, Ms. See? PRE. We're, <laughs> we're learning you, people. I could have thrown the word physics. You're learning physics right now. Okay? So you can do this. You can do this. But we're just getting started. Just wanted to let y'all know that. We're at the beginning stages. Sorry, Ms. Lara. You say uh, the middle prevents uh, arcing? That is wrong. Thank you. Ms. Laura, so does the, does the housing just have like a, a higher negative charge in the electron stream? Is that why it has the, it creates the potential difference? The what? I'm sorry, the metal? Yeah, yeah like the, uh, the so the, 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 the metal envelope? Uh, are you, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm coming up just a little bit. That's fine. The metal envelope has a greater potential difference. Potential difference is—is is it because these differences go from like a high potential to a low potential? Like I, I understand that concept. I would just—it's it's the, the, the potential difference used here, Jonan, is the fact that you're going from huh? a negative and to a positive. So when you think of potential difference. When you think about what is the actual negative attraction to the positive attraction, right? Right. Okay, so uh -huh. that's the potential difference means here. So the higher the potential yes. attraction. Okay. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, like, just, just thinking about, like, like the potential difference between the cathode and the anode, you have the... Uh, 
you have yeah, the, 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 a little bit. Yeah. Well, the potential difference between the cathode and the anode is the cathode is going to be negative, yeah. and the anode is going to be which is negative. Right. So that's where yeah. you're going to have electrons yeah. flow. Yeah. As a higher. You may want to try it, John, John N, because you're cutting off, so I'm not quite sure. Okay, yeah, so I'm just trying to understand, like, how the... Uh, mm, you're cutting off, John N, so you may want to chat it. I don't know, um, but I definitely want to answer your question. But the potential... Go ahead and give... Hmm? Mm -hmm. Just to kind of elaborate what Jonna was asking, and maybe it's not what it is, but we're going to talk about positive and negative side. And so potential difference is going to be the type of attraction, how the magnitude of attraction. So when we start to actually talk about what is charging the positive side and what is charging the negative side, we're going to talk about different types of um, energy. Okay, or electricity. So, but right now, I want you to know that electricity means the flow of electrons. Okay, that's all I need you to know right now. I promise you, it's all going to come together. Okay, and we like electricity to flow from one direction over to the other. Okay, everyone, yes, please. Yes, thank you. Miss Lara, mm -hmm. the you know how you said that the um, um, the metal envelope prevents electron arcing. The glass does the same thing, right? But the metal is more resistant. Um, the glass doesn't do it as effective because it doesn't have the element. It doesn't have the metallic property in order to attract. So the glass doesn't really prevent metal arcing. I mean, uh, electronic arcing. The metal envelope does because of the what it's made of. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. And it's almost going back. Does metal get hot? Does metal get hot? Yes. Metal can get hot. So it's not good for heat, right? But what we're seeing here in a metal envelope, it promotes uh, the life of the tube or the tube expectancy, life expectancy, because it allows or it, it kind of balances to keep those electrons flowing in the stream in that short distance it's supposed to. We need electrons to flow. That is going to be part one of our three-part recipe to make um, elect uh, uh, photons, okay? Well, actually, it's going to be part two of our three-part recipe to make photons, x-rays. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions before we move on to more of the anode? Now we're talking specifically just the x-ray tube. Yes. Okay. Um, I, oh, sorry. I have a question. Um, and the last slide where you said um, the target window? Yeah. Um. Can you explain a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to oh. the target window in just a moment, okay? okay. So we're going to talk. So we talked about the general construct. We have two different types, okay? Remember, the X-ray tube has an anode. It has a cathode. We've already talked about the glass or metal enclosure, which is the envelope. And we're also going to talk about the induction motor. But right now, we're going to start with and stop on the anode, okay? So the anode is the positive, positive, positive charge of the tube. It is positive. Laura, sorry to interrupt, uh, but can you check your private message, please? Okay, let me see. <sighs> Okay, got it. All right. Okay, so the anode is the positive charge of the tube or the positive end of the tube. 
Now remember, the positive symbol is the plus sign. The positive symbol is the plus sign, okay? The plus sign. So it is the positive end of our diode. I can say it in so many different forms, right? If I said, what's the positive end of our diode? Oh, Miss Laura, that's the anode, right? Yes? So we know that there's a diode. We know the X-ray tube has two charges, two sides, electricity coming in and electricity going out. Okay, the anode is the positive side. The anode side also has the target. The target is there to receive the electrons. Remember we said electrons are going to flow. Electrons are going to flow. We need the electrons to interact with our target. The anode contains the target. The anode also serves as an electrical and thermal conductor. Kind of going back to what the slide said. Here we have our anode right here. Electricity is going to come in there's going to be our target. Our electricity will continue on. So it is an electrical conductor. And we're gonna talk about thermal capabilities. Its construct is going to help dissipate heat or absorb heat. So the anode is positive. It provides the target. It is going to be an electrical conductor because right above it, there is a high tension cable that's going to lead out back to the wall. And it is going to be constructed of material that is going to dissipate or absorb heat. The electrons that are flowing over will either hit the target at the target the electrons hit the target. This is where x-rays are produced. X-rays are at, produced at the target. Where is the target? On what side? The anode. The anode side. So x-rays are produced at the target of the anode. How? Electrons interact at the target. The rest of the electrical flow, which is the electrons that don't get converted into x-rays, will continue on out back to the wall. It'll go back to the wall circuit. Electricity is coming in. Something is going to happen here. Beautiful, wonderful magic. It's going to happen here. Electrons will flow here. Electrons that don't get converted back into x-ray will flow back out. Everyone kind of understand? Yes? Good. Now, I need you to write something for me. I want you to write the recipe for x-rays. The recipes for x-rays. Number one. You need a, an electron source. Leave space so you can write notes. Number one, you need an electron source. Only free electrons can make x-rays, so you need an electron source. Two, you need electrons to flow. This is called current. Electrons flowing in motion is called current. So electrons flowing in a current is called electrical current. So number one, you need an electron source. Two, you need those electrons to flow or current, electrical current. 
And three, you need the electrons to be um, abruptly stopped. Number three, you need those electrons that are flowing to be abruptly stopped. Number one, you need a source for electrons. Number two, you need the electrons to flow. And number three, you need those electrons to be abruptly stopped. And then you have made x-rays and heat. Okay? Yes? Good. Did you add it to your notes? Did you add it to your diet? Perfect. All right. So the anode is the positive side. It provides the target. At the target is where the electrons are going to be abruptly stopped. At the target, the electrons are going to be abruptly stopped. There is going to be a conversion at the target. X-rays and heat. X-rays and heat. X-rays and heat. Got it? Any questions? So let's take a look at what's happening. So we know that the anode is positive. What do I mean by that? I just put one word there. Uh, let's see, Stephanie, what does that mean when I say the positive? Now, okay, you have three dogs and someone forcibly takes away okay. two of them. I'm sorry, what was the question? What did, when I say the word positive, what does that mean? And I'm relaying it to the x-ray tube. What does that mean? When I say it's the positive, anode. It's the anode. Perfect. Okay, it's the a charge of the charge. tube. It is a positive charge, and I can kind of see the positive charge already on this diagram, so I know that this is my anode. It provides the target. What happens at the target, uh, Harkins, John? Uh, electrons, they hit the anode. They hit the anode at the target. X -rays. That's where the x-rays are produced. Perfect. I love it. Why do I say it's an electrical and thermal conductor, Daniel? It produces the The question is, okay, let's go with here. What is it electrical about the anode? What's going to happen? Why does it an electrical conductor? Uh, because it can, it can produce and store the electrons. It can't store them. It can't store them. Um, electrical conductor because electricity is going to come in and electricity is going to go out. It's going to be able to conduct electricity. Thermal. Why, Luke? Why is the anode a thermal conductor? Because of the heat that's also produced during it. Beautiful. So it's constructed of materials that is going to absorb or dissipate heat, right? Yes. This is important because I'm going to move on. So let's take a look at this diagram. Electricity is coming in from the negative side, which we're going to learn is the cathode. Here's the electricity. Here we're going to have, here we have electricity, but it is in a wire. We need a free Free, free, free electrons individually by themselves, right? To be liberated here through a type of energy a conversion. The electricity, the electrons are going to flow into a current, interact with the target. Most of them are it most of it is going to be a heat conversion of energy. X-rays are also going to form. The electricity that did not interact with the target is going to continue to flow back up the high tension cables. Does everyone understand that? Electricity in and electricity out. But in the process of electricity in and out, we have a source of electrons, we have a current, they're flowing, and they are abruptly stopped and the creation of x-rays. Wow, didn't that, awesome, didn't it? 
just like, is that it? Is that all? I've learned physics, Justly. You've learned it. That's it. No mas, finito. You wish. So much more to go. But this is fundamental. We have learned about protective housing. We're still learning about the construct of the tube. But you know the two types of metal, uh, I mean, two types of uh, tube envelopes, right? Yes? What part of the diode contains the target? Sharon. The anode. What is so special about the target? Do you want? I'm sorry, can you repeat what, What's so special about the target? Um, like, it's, um, the thing is, it says as all these? No, it's not. That's where the x-rays are made. That's where they're born. That's where they're made. They're being released. X-rays are made at the target. Got it? Beautiful. All right. We're going to talk about different types of anodes. There are two types of anodes. There's one that is called stationary because it doesn't move. The target does not move. The target stays still. The electrons hit the target at the same spot all the time. So what happens and why is this a disadvantage? The rapidly building heat, because remember, it's a lot of heat. How much heat? No one has asked me how much heat. How much heat? 99% of the electron interaction at the target is heat. Only 1% of that interaction forms into x-rays. 99% of electron flow is converted into heat. Only 1% is converted into x-ray. Not very efficient, is it? Not efficient at all, right? But we have no better way. So. When you have a stationary anode, the target does not move. The disadvantage is you're building up a lot of heat. And like we said earlier, if there's a lot of heat, your machine shuts down if it gets overloaded with heat. Okay. The second one, better, is the rotating anode. You have the stationary anode, and then you have the rotating anode. The rotating anode, and we're going to talk about these wonderful words here in a minute, because they're materials, and we're going to talk about that. The rotating anode, this whole thing right here is called a disc. This is a disc. This is a disc. And the disc rotates really, 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 really fast. So that when the electrons come over and they strike the anode, all of this, it's at different parts of the disc. So it does not hit in the same place. So this advantage over the stationary, it's able to move heat, converted heat, around the glass or metal envelope and then into the oil that lines the protective housing okay any questions a lot uh, miss laura can you so repeat the part where mm -hmm. you said that the electrons once the electrons come over and they strike the anode the so it just keeps rotating yeah, that's going to eventually called a focal track, but we're going to get there. We're going to okay. get there. 
but it's going to hit. So this is constantly rotating and the electrons are bombarding. It's bombarding different parts of it. So a lot of the heat is being dissipated. It's being moved around as opposed to here. It's just hitting here, right? The heat has nowhere to go, but to stay around. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to get to before I give you a review is that I want you to start paying attention because you're going to be seeing some really weird words. You're going to be seeing the word copper. Copper's not that weird, right? We know copper. Copper, right? We know what about copper. Copper insulates, okay? So we have copper. We also have molybdenum. And we're going to be talking a lot about Tungsten. Tungsten. Tungsten is going to be your new best friend word. Tungsten. So the construct of the tube, you're going to see tungsten. Oh, I didn't even give. I got to put nickel in here. Nickel. So tungsten, molybdenum, copper. These are all materials from the periodic table. What makes one different than the other is their atomic properties. So molybdenum has 42 electrons. Tungsten has 74 electrons. Got it? Yeah. So it's just different materials that are making or constructed from the um, glass tube. So I will let's do a quick review just to make sure that we can encapsulate everything we have learned. I see eyes glazing backwards. It's okay. I understand. It's a lot. I have a question. Sure. Um, I don't know if it has any relationship to it, but I just thought about it. Um, does the stationary anode and rotating anode, uh, like, do they have, like, how do I explain it? Like, do they go with a specific envelope? Like, does one go with the glass and one goes with the metal? Or both is it inside. Not? They're both inside. You oh, either, okay. For one thing I need, I need to say, you can either have one or the other. Either you have a glass envelope or you have a metal. You can't have both. Either you have a stationary anode or you have a rotating anode. You cannot have both. Okay. Makes sense? And they yeah. both live in the, both anode types, either the stationary or the or the rotating one, live inside of the glass or the x-ray tube. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about the tube head. We've talked about the protective housing. Protective housing houses the x-ray tube. We have high x-ray intensities. We have electricity coming in and electricity flowing out. This is why it's called an electrical conductor here on the anode side, as well as the cathode side. We're going to get there. We know that x-rays are going to, when we do conversions of x-rays, only 1% is x-ray. The rest of it is um, heat. So heat becomes a big issue for us. So thermal cushion or insulation has to be taken care of. Okay? Good. Protective housing is lead-lined. That's for that leakage radiation. Okay? Anything that's formed outside of the target or does not go into the stream outside of the tube like we want, there has to be a lead-lined structure to absorb it. The oil and the cooling fan is for heat dissipation. Touching the metal... You're not going to have an electrical shock, even though you have high tension cables, a lot of high voltage coming in. So there is a specific amount of radiation to a certain distance that is considered safe operations. So that means to tell us that there is some leakage radiation that it emits from your tube at all times. However, if there's more than 100 millirankins per hour, at a distance of one meter, it needs to be turned off and it needs to be recalibrated. Does everyone understand that? Good, that is referencing to leakage radiation. Um, we talked about different parts of the x-ray tube. We have the anode side, which is the positive side, okay? The anode tube positive side. This is a vacuum tube, meaning that there's no air. It is void of air. Okay. 
There is the types of envelopes. You either have the glass, which is best at conducting heat or dissipating heat. Metal is best for arcing, which is the arcing of electricity path, right? Which makes it very much more inefficient. So the glass, um, the metal envelope prevents arcing and therefore extending the tube life. Let's see, there's electronic arcing. The anode contains the target. At the target, we, that's where x-rays are gonna be formed, converted, right? Um, at the anode side, it's also con uh, connected to those high tension cables. So electricity is going to go back out to the wall circuit. What is the three things that we need to create X-rays, give me number one, Sharon. The source. We need an electron source. Number two, Aurora. Electrons to flow, um, the current, flow. electrical current. Current, perfect. And then number three, Justly. It has to be stopped. It has to be abruptly stopped. Abrupt. Abruptly stop. And where does that happen at? The target. Good job. <laughs> Y'all are doing it. Okay. So when, uh -huh. so when I get back, I need y'all to know what these materials are. So when I see you on Wednesday at 8 a.m. talking about this, I want you to understand what the materials are inside of the tube. We're going to talk about electromagnetic induction motor. And we're going to continue on the process. Got it? But I need you to go back over what you're not clear with. This is the time. Don't wait till later. Got it? Yes? Yes, Miss Laura. You're one of people. Ms. Laura, I have a quick question. Sure. So you mentioned that leakage radiation is going to be less than 100 milli Rankin per hour at like a meter. Perfect. And if it were more than that, it would be an issue. But how would we know if it were more than that? When the physicist comes in, they can use a um, Geiger, Geiger counter, um, and that's basically to detect radiation. So they have their de devices to see. So if you say, I don't know, let's just say, you know what? I've been noticing my imaging plates have been getting fogged. We're going to talk about what fog means later. But that's an indicator saying, oh, I, there's some type of radiation being emitted. Okay, or more than what it is, but it undergoes safety measures um, every six months or a year. But I want you to understand that because that's going to that's an FDA requirement. It's a standard, and so you'll need it for the registry. Okay. All right. Ms. Laura, for the periodic table for the elements in there, you just want us to know the element, the number of electrons in. Um, I don't really need you to know the, the number of electrons. Honestly, the only one that we're really going to be spending a lot of time with the number of electrons is going to be tungsten because tungsten is going to be everything. Tungsten okay. is where the interactions happen. So we actually are going to start looking at tungsten atoms. Okay. Okay. Only tungsten, but I just wanted you to see the whole purpose of this. It's x-ray tube materials. So what is molybdenum? Molybdenum is a metal. And that's all I need you to know. Molybdenum is good for absorbing heat or dissipating heat. That's why the anode has molybdenum. What is copper? What does copper do? So this is why we have those materials. But the one that we're going to spend a lot is good old W right here, tungsten. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think rhenium is also in there, thorium, but it's very small. We'll talk about it. And nickel is also what we're... Um, using for our, our materials for our tube. Anything else? So know the difference. What is an annotate, a, a rotating anode and a station, and the difference between a rotating and a stationary? Jalisha. A rotating anode has like a little motor that's gonna rotate it so that the electrons aren't hitting the same spot and the stationary yes, anode is just gonna. What? what kind of shape does it have? A disc shape. There you go, perfect, good. And, and a stationary? And the stationary, I think it was like the little square thing that the x-rays are just hitting directly Absolutely. at the same spot. Y'all are on it. Y'all made me so proud. So thank you very much for making your first PRE, like real hard PRE class, come to a light. I think you guys are off to a great start. Okay? So keep it going. Don't wait for me to explain it. Keep reading.
All right? Don't give me that look, Luke. All right. I'll see y'all later. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> uh.